No, oh, here's our first concrete truck, everyone. All right. <laughs> Welcome back to the Concrete Pour. We are finishing the walls today. I'm gonna to introduce you to Bruno in a second, but I just wanted to say a couple things, because there are people who are starting to tune in on this channel, having no idea what this channel is about. So number one, I am the builder of this house. It's a high performance house. It's gonna be doing a lot of interesting things that normal houses don't do and normal builders don't do. If you're a normal builder, please wait until the end of this video before you open your big mouth in the comments section. Number two, a lot of people think they know a lot about concrete, um, and I have learned a lot from the comments. This is a conversation. I actually look at all the comments on this and I will respond to you if it's something that is reasonable. Again, I'm very happy with my contractor. And again, every thinking person should say, well, that's a very interesting way that you want to do that. Here's why we normally do it a different way. But if you really want to do it that way, we'll find a way to do it. In fact, my contractor was so excited about how passionate I am about this project that he was willing to put a hold on the job so that I could figure out a slump test because a lot of commenters on the footing video said we have to do a slump test. Don't even pour a drop of concrete before you do a slump test and verify that it's the right slump. We're not doing a slump test. If you don't want to believe me, some guy who's building his own house and you've never heard of, it's fine. Matt Reisinger is the building guy on YouTube and I have it quoted that it's not important, especially in the winter time. If you have a really expensive job and, and they really want to do it, you can hire an engineer to come out and do it. But generally, what you want to do is look at the ticket that comes with the concrete truck and they're going to tell you what PSI, the, the strength rating of that. And we're right now going to pump today 4,000 PSI, slightly higher than normal. Uh, into this and that is because of the specifications for my structural engineer who also didn't want to specify the slump and that's the other thing is that he's like this whole slump thing Nobody like who tells wants. you what the slump is so this is Bruno Bruno Martinez is the pump driver and operator right Correct. so can, what's what's your background and how do you well, what do you think about performance of concrete well first of all I want to say the concrete pump operator is always right <laughs> you know okay you'll get plenty of this <laughs> <laughs> no uh, everybody does it a little bit different right a lot of the times, if we're doing a, a footing, we want to have it a, a tighter slump. So you want to do, you know, like maybe a three and a half, four, four and a half, somewhere around there. You know, some guys like five. Um, just depends. You want to talk to, you know, your finishers and see what they want to do as well. So that's why we like a little bit wetter slump, five, five and a half. If you come with a three inch slump, we're going to be like, you know, most of the time, no, unless it's a commercial job, you know, if they have to have it at a certain slump, then right. that's a little bit different. When the thing leaves the plant, they're going to have it at a certain slump, but then if a guy gets stuck in traffic, he's going to maybe add more water to it to make sure it doesn't dry out right. more. The concrete right? will dry out, you know, if he's got a 10 minute drive, it's not going to dry out as much. But if he's driving from across town 45 minutes, especially with traffic here in Atlanta, you know, everywhere it takes you 45 minutes. The concrete left there, let's say at a four inch slump, it shows up here at a, a two and a half or a three. So. A lot of the times we'll take a look at the concrete before we go to prime it out, and if I see it needs to, you know, be uh, have a little bit more water, I'll have them add, let's say, uh, 10 gallons. So it's at a four-inch slump. We'll add 10 gallons. Now it'll be a five-inch slump. So 10 gallons to the entire truck means you add an inch of slump, basically. Right. We'll add 10 gallons of water, and they'll mix it up, and then you know once that's done, then yeah, we have a, a higher slump because you added water to that. Cool. That concrete. Now all this is academic because honestly. I have stopped caring about this. Um, I think that it's interesting that there are people that you hire, experts that you hire, who know about this stuff and are going to make sure that the slump that got out of the factory and the slump that's delivered to the site and the slump that goes into the hopper in Bruno's truck and the slump that's going to come out of this 100 feet of pipe that's this big around, it's like not science at that point, right? We're adding water and we're trying to, it's an art. So that's why you have teams of people who are like working on this and they know what it looks like. And I've had several of you say, Oh, I looked at your concrete, it looks fine. And just from like a YouTube video that's this big. So I think that's really, it's just an interesting variation on the performance conversation. Right. So now let's get started with this pour. All right, let's make the magic happen. So this is finished wall. We poured half of the wall the other day and then we used those forms to put over here. You can see what the forms look like. They're beautiful. They've got ladder steps on the outside so that you can climb up and get inside. And this thing is basically as strong as the wall is going to be. It's held together with these bars inside and we're going to lose those inside the concrete. They'll be embedded in there forever. We just snap off the ends later. 
and we've got extra reinforcements here with two by fours leaning up against it, but it's also fastened into the actual concrete of the footing. So it's not going anywhere. And we're also gonna use, you'll see a vibrator being used to get all the air bubbles out of the concrete so that any concrete nerds who are watching this are satisfied. Yes, this is a real concrete crew who have been doing this for decades. This thing is a little bit hard to screw up because it's only four feet tall. I've just had my inspector and a whole bunch of different people say, well, it's only a four foot wall, so not a big deal. And I know that some of you are gonna say, everything is a big deal. Uh, that's why I'm just saying you need to relax a little bit. There is always a good enough in everything. And so this wall has in the top of it, the anchor bolts. We're gonna fasten down the sill plate and I'm gonna have to place those before the concrete dries, but not when it's too wet. So now the foundation walls are done. I will not pretend not to be exhausted, but I am happy. Uh, and just to review, what this whole channel is about with the performance and especially the invisible dynamic performance of the physics and chemistry of a home over the long term. And when I say long term, I'm not talking about the life of the mortgage. I don't care about that. I'm talking about 100 years or more for generations of my family to come, I hope. I know most people don't build like that. But um, as the builder and as the homeowner, I am looking long term. And when you look at each individual person on a job, you're looking at the for example, the pump driver, Bruno, who knows a lot about concrete, a lot about pumps. His most fierce incentive is to make sure that the concrete does not get stuck in his pump. So the wetter, the better is the like very broad incentive for a pump operator. Bruno is not necessarily looking at the long term, what would it, the concrete is going to be like in 100 years. I trust that he does know how to combine those two things, just like I know how to combine cheerleading and intimidation when I'm talking about trying to find the solution to these problems that you might not even know exist. And if you watch this channel, you'll learn more and more about those problems. So what happens next with this concrete wall that is now finished and it's got the anchor bolts in the top. And by the way, talking about long-term and why you need to have an advocate and the advocate can be the builder and it can be a third party inspector and it can be you, the homeowner uh, that's out on site. These anchor bolts were specified by the structural engineer to be in certain places. If I'm giving that to my foundation crew to make sure that these things are in the right places, that's not their job to care about how the framing works above this. So my job, since I'm also the framing crew, is to make sure that they're not getting in the way of my floor joists that I know I'm gonna lay out and that they're not gonna get in the way of columns and beams and that they meet the specifications set out by the structural engineer. So they need to be 12 inches from the end of each board the boards are only 16 feet long. This wall is 36 feet long. So now I have to have three boards. I have to know where the ends are. I have to have the, you know, them spaced 12 inches apart at the end of the board, blah, blah, blah. You don't need to know all this stuff. I'm just saying whoever sets those things better care what happens next with the framing. Because if they don't care, why should they do it right? Now, what happens next is, first of all, we've got these clips that are sticking out that I had them not knock off this time. That was my dad's idea because coincidentally, the rock wool insulation that's about to go on the outside of these walls is also three feet wide, just like the forms were. So now I could potentially use those clips to hold the insulation up on the wall instead of using something like adhesive. And we're gonna get into all that stuff when we, when we attach this. Um, and also the waterproofing, which is the platen, which is also from uh, North American Pipe Corporation. So this system is made to be used not with continuous insulation. So I've got two different ways I could do it. I could put the waterproofing dimple board outside the, the insulation, in which case there's not gonna be an air gap behind the insulation, in which case I like that. Or I could put the dimple board first and then put the insulation outboard of that. And there's pros and cons to both. I will explore this further and I will get back to you on what I learned from both manufacturers, not just from searching on Google with uh, you know certain search terms and finding some crazy people who say things on blogs. So uh, pay attention to your details that are from the manufacturers. Make sure that you stay in the contract. And some of the builders who have been commenting on the, the first concrete pour video were like, hey, this should be in the contract. Yes, it should be in the contract. All this stuff needs to be in the contract. Deliver to code minimums, deliver to manufacturers instructions and specifications. We got a lot of work ahead of us. I'm getting first lumber delivered on Wednesday and we're gonna be able to start with the rest of this stuff. You can see inboard of the walls in the slab area the gravel. Now, I'm just going to point out to you that I, a mistake that I made, which is that we wanted to be able to get the gravel in there easily. It's like four to six inches solid of gravel and sometimes a little bit more. So I had basically three truckloads of 57 stone gravel 
come in and doing that by hand is going to be a big pain in the butt. So we rented a skid steer and I drove it up and over the former drain and over the footing that had already been dried. I put gravel all over the whole thing just to make a little ramp so that I wouldn't be crushing the former drain. But what happened was the former drain got pulled away from the concrete footing and gravel got stuffed down in between the two. That's not really a huge problem. Where it happened is not going to be a major wet spot. Uh, most of the water is going to be collecting on this front face because we've got the hill coming this way. But it's just something to note. If you're going to be driving over the thing with a skid steer uh, on your own build, make sure to put a tarp down first, which is what we did later. We pulled all the gravel out of there, put a tarp down, then re-graveled over the top of it, and now you don't have that problem with the gravel going down. So stay tuned, comment, like, subscribe. Um, if you have better ways of doing it, that's great for other people. I'm done. I'm not doing this anymore. Nobody tell me to rip this out that it's not professional looking. It is. Uh, so I hope you enjoy. I hope you learned something. I sure have. See you next time.